Hey, Nathan. I was fortunate enough to see Nathan speak at previous uh, FOS4G state of the map conferences in Oceania. And uh, I think you've got a really interesting story to tell Nathan because you're not, you're not a computer scientist, you're not a, a robot, but you're very involved in uh, the open source software community. And uh, what I think is great is learning how does the community work? I know how I live my life and I know my colleagues and friends, but I wanna know how it's going for you. So could you please tell us your story? Sure, I'll just um, share my screen here, which doesn't seem to be working for some reason. I can see the small one, but the present part isn't working. There you go. Yep, that's it. Um, thanks, yeah, so I've been, I've been involved in uh, QS and open source for about uh, nine years, ten years or so, probably ten years because I used it before I got involved as a developer, so this is a bit more of a, a property book, uh, less technical, um, so um, it's definitely very um, arty, um, so I don't even know, it's everything in open source is just code, it's just code everywhere, um, it's not at all because code just writes itself, um, and that's very good about it, so because ultimately the fund of the code is the people that write it, code doesn't write itself. Um, open source itself, by definition, isn't necessarily people. You can have a, a project which is not down to all, it can be a solo project. Um, I've got solo projects that aren't, um, that don't have any community around them at all. Um, so ultimately, you don't have to write it. Uh, Nathan, I just wanted to interrupt. The audio is not very good. Could you try turning off your uh, video camera? Better now? Yeah, that's better. Thanks. Yeah, so between between all that code is um, a very diverse group of people, ultimately. So when you join a project, you, you end up with lots of mixed uh, personalities um, in the project because ultimately the, the communities the communities themselves grow that code base up. If you have a solo project and it's just your own, you don't have to worry about um, all the inter intertwined um, communication between people. but in large projects, there's definitely a lot of uh, people, and in those in those groups of people, you can grow some solid um, friendships from that group, which is basically what um, has come out of my um, story, I suppose. So one of the things here is finding people that um, that you enjoy talking to in the group, in those communities, and um, latch onto them to be motivators for you to help you mo to motivate you through the. The, the process of the, uh, the contributing to the code, contributing to the community. There are some people in that, um, in those circles, which may not be developers. They may be, uh, they may just be, uh, they may be uh, documenta documentation writers. They might just be not hard users, but it helps to find people in that community that you quite enjoy uh, collaborating with. So you can motivate yourself to keep, keep going. Being a solo developer with no, uh, no close, close user ties can make it quite difficult to uh, to grow your skill base, especially. So when I first joined QGIS, there was a few people that, that helped mentor me through the process, and ultimately that helped me develop my skills to be the developer that I am today. Without them helping mentor me through that process, I don't think I would have been where I am at the moment. So that's how the course um, brings us to a, the friendship point. People aren't, um, because of the diversity in the groups, you can, you can actually find some really people, people that you really gel with, even though they might come from different places in the world, different personalities, different religious backgrounds, and things like that. So this is a good funny quote from Randall, who we, we chat quite regularly, um, answered one question and basically been stuck with me ever since. But ultimately, that's a mutual, that's a mutual uh, friendship talking about all sorts of things, U US politics and Australian politics and 
how the current his current canoeing adventures are going, things like that. But he's also an avid QGIS user and an avid PostGIS user. So it helps me chat to him about those things, about um, issues that he may be having. But if he was if I just discounted him as a as a standard user and I didn't um, care to, to build that friendship up, I would have lost that entire connection to another part of the world that I currently have. <clears throat> so one of these uh, one of these points is to look outside of the outside of the community you're currently in for inspiration to be better in the community that you're in, basically. So there's people in the other open source communities, not necessarily spatial, but things like um, the .NET community or the Rust community or the Go community or even OpenStreetMap community, things that you're not actually part of because I'm not part of any of those other communities, but I'm primarily in um, the QGIS community. But people like Scott Hanselman and um, Kelsey Hightower, they're very um, motivating people. So ultimately, I look to them to find uh, to find inspiration to try and make myself better in my own community. One of those things that, especially some of those higher profile open source developers try to, they tend to do well is to not have that inflated ego. Um, you can take it from me that ultimately the power that comes from being able to change the code and develop features, change what you want in the project can come, sometimes come with a bit of an ego trip. Unfortunately, that ego trip is, is a negative thing. You, do, you don't want that. Ultimately, that will highly impact the amount of people that want to be um, around you, and it can actually damage your reputation in the community and also damage bringing newcomers on. So if you act like a rock star, there's, there's very few rock stars who are, who are not um, totally crazy. So ultimately, if, you're, if you act like a rock star, people tend to gravitate away from you. There's a few communities who have these high profile, full of ego rock star kind of developers, and they can flourish, Linux being one of those, but ultimately does a lot of damage at some point. So make sure you check it before you try and um, think you're too better than everyone else. That also leads into this point hold here. If you if you come in with a full blown ego, um, expecting everyone just to bow down to your wishes and to to be to treat you as a, a king and they're just all normal users and they don't um, deserve your attention, ultimately that will damage the community and damage yourself. So uh, you will actually make it quite difficult to make friends within those communities if you put yourself up on the pedestal. So it's best to not put yourself up on a pedestal and bring yourself down in with, with everyone else basically because everyone is equal and everyone can contribute in their own special way. It's ultimately just about finding those groups of people that you can collaborate with to be better. So this talk is primarily not aimed at people who are already in those circles. It's mainly aimed at people who are on the edges, basically. So people who are coming into the community who haven't quite learnt where they um, where they fit in um, in those communities. But if you if you want to make the communities better, you have to also also try and be ultimately a better person um, in that process. Um, one of these points is also that. People have, people have lives outside of um, open source work and come as a bit of shock to some people that they should be, that you should be doing open source work um, for free and that, you know, people are expected to be bug fixing all the time for you because you're a user and you want things now, basically. So it's also for other developers to be aware that if you send someone a message, you may not actually get um, a response back for a day or so or two days or a week because people are outside doing things. And that's ultimately part of that understanding that building that friendship up of understanding when people are online and when people are offline. If I if I send someone a message in the US during the middle of our day, they're not necessarily gonna see it um, until a little bit later and the same thing with them. So I can't expect them to be online actively um, just for me, but that helps grow that um, connection up more. So, the problem, one of the problems that I had with open source early on was that I um, threw myself into it quite heavily, and that's because I've made a lot of good connections in it. It's quite addictive. The, the, the adrenaline rush that comes with it is quite high. So if you do that too much, you'll burn out. Um, that's a personal anecdote of my own burnout story there. Um, so ultimately having other hobbies also branches out your community, your friend group. Turns out there's a lot of people in the open source community, um, especially in the ones that I'm in, who are also into board gaming, which I'm also into, or also into hobby painting, um, miniature painting, which I'm also into. 
So having those those overlaps of communities and seeing that there's people who do other things outside of open source helps you be a bit more grounded rather than just constantly get your head in the code all the time and with no um, with no motivation to do anything else. It can also help you draw some inspiration. Some of the ideas that I've had have come out of outside hobbies from non-code related hobbies that have translated into code ideas, which, which works quite well. Um, as I said before, Scott Hanselman's quite one of my, he's, he's one of my, um, I'm not sure what the word is, I look after him as, as the term, I suppose. Um, he has a thing that he says almost every year on repeat, I suspect he deletes this tweet and then retweets it every year, is um, to follow the whole person ultimately. So there are people on Twitter who started off doing a lot of work in a particular stream, and then as soon as they start diverging off that stream, bringing in politics or um, their family life or their hobbies and things like that, people drop off because they're like, well, we followed you for this particular topic. So my advice, and it's not a good way to make friends ultimately thinking that someone's there just for that use case only and never about anything else in their life. Um, so following Scott's advice is basically to follow the entire person. If they've got hobbies, then if you don't want to see those hobbies, you can always mute the or don't follow that particular stream of their of their um, life. But ultimately, people in the communities are real people and not just robots. So they're going to have things that don't that don't um, always involve their open source projects. I'm just going to finish on this point here that the open source the open source connections that you can build during the, the, the connections you can build while working on open source are probably more powerful than most people realize. It seems like such a simple thing to take some code, write it, contribute it, and, and then say that's it, like that's all, I've been, that's all I've done. But the connections you can grow from that and the people that you can meet and the doors that those people can open for you from a career point of view are, are much probably more valuable than what the code is. The, the career progression that I've had in my life uh, is purely based on my open source work early on. The people that I knew, the people that saw me working on open source projected my career up to where it is now, basically. So if you are one of the people who are in a more senior position in an open source project, it helps to mentor and bring up people and open those doors for the people who are maybe less privileged, who don't have access to um, certain areas of the, of the community, um, or don't have necessarily have the ability to get to certain things themselves. You can help them get to those um, events, things like that. So um, opening opening doors for people and having those connections really helps to cement down the communities themselves. So the people that I know around the world from doing my open source project, people in Australia, this whole conference, they're all connections that probably to me matter ultimately as a person more than what ultimately the code does. The code can be here or go on the next day, but the people, the friendships do not go away. So um, that's the point I'll probably leave you on. Um, so thanks. Thanks, Nathan. That's a really good insights you provided. I really appreciate it. Uh, we got a question from Matthew Fry. He says, slightly off topic, but how did your experience in, a, in an open source online and remote community assist you in the last six months of lockdown. What was that like for you? Um, so it helps me mainly because I don't have a lot of friends in my close proximity. Um, most of my friends either live in my hometown. I've got a few close close friends in the neighborhood here, but um, during the, especially during the lockdown situation, we couldn't see anyone. So having that having that remote community that I could reach across the, the ocean and talk to people in different time zones, no matter what that time it was for me, um, helped quite a lot, ultimately. It means that there's almost no period of time where there's no one, there's, there's I got the full range of the day that someone's available, basically, no matter what. So that helps to have that sort of spread across the world, rather than just having your current local neighborhood and no one else. Thanks, Nathan. They got another question. Uh, Andrew Jeffrey, he's asking, on the topic of hobbies, what is the all-time favorite board game? Huh. Thanks, Andrew. You have to put, I'm not going to answer that question. It's like um, picking children. So no, 